Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and greetings. I'm Dr. Robert Kilpatrick, the chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum here at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco. Uh, Welcome. Uh, Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, all of our programs are currently uh, delivered digitally. Oh, COVID-19, speaking of which, we have a fabulous program today. It's in our Healthy Society series, and it's called COVID-19 vaccines, what we know and what we don't know. And we have two stellar experts joining us today. First, we have uh, Melanie Ott, MD, PhD, who is director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology since 2020. And she is a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco. She is also a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. And since the outbreak of the um, coronavirus pandemic, she has pivoted the focus of her research team to work on SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. She's a member of many, many organizations, including the COVID Collaborative, which is a bipartisan group of national experts and institutions that helps shape state and local efforts against the pandemic. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Our second uh, guest today is Warner Green, MD, PhD, another doctor doctor, and he is director of the Gladstone Center for HIV Cure Research, a senior investigator, and Nick and Sue Hellman, distinguished professor of translational medicine at the Gladstone Institutes. He's the founding and emeritus director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology. And Dr. Green is also a professor of medicine, microbiology and immunology at the University of California, San Francisco. He also has uh, an amazing biography and I don't wanna take too much time out of our program. So welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you, Robert. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So um, the organizing concept um, for this um, discussion today is, you know, looking at the COVID-19 vaccine, which is really on everybody's mind now, including my own, what do we know uh, and how do we know it? And what don't we know and how will we know more? So in conversations, I discovered that the two of you have both had your two COVID-19 vaccine jabs. And on Saturday, I had my first Moderna jab. So, you know, we've all had all or part of our vaccine. So I'd like to begin uh, really from the perspective that um, before we're scientists or uh, representatives of a club like I am, we're human beings. So, Warner, what do you expect the vaccine to do for you and for me? Well, I feel, Robert, I feel so blessed that I have an opportunity to receive uh, one of these two amazing vaccines. I mean, 2020 was dark and discouraging, but I think we're going to look back on 2020 as a true triumph of science that within a one year period of time, 95% effective vaccines were delivered and others uh, coming down the pipeline as well uh, that will be amenable to distribution around the world so we can put this pandemic in our rear view mirror. Um, How, you know, I know this is difficult to reduce very complex science to simple statements, but in, in a nutshell, how, does this vaccine behave in our bodies in relation to the COVID-19 virus? What is it, what is it supposed to be doing? This virus, so the RNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, the ones that are now FDA approved, 
These are small pieces of RNA that encode the spike protein, which is the surface coat that gives this virus its corona name. And this, uh, and it's in, enveloped in a lipid gel. And so that gets injected right into your uh, arm. And that messenger RNA enters the cell thanks to the lipid uh, nanoparticle. And then it's translated into the protein spike. And then that spike protein is presented to the immune system and the immune system trains on to be able to respond to that spike protein, both with antibody production and T cells, cytotoxic T cells. So it's, I mean, it's an amazing technology. None of us would have ever, ever predicted that this would work at the efficiency or the efficacy level that it is. It's like hit, it's going to a baseball game and seeing in four consecutive innings, four Grand Slam home runs. Well, as a Giants fan, I, I can tell you I like that metaphor. So, uh, Melanie, I want to uh, move over to you for, for a moment. So uh, there, are, there are several uh, different vaccines. Uh, for example, there's the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine. There's the AstraZeneca Oxford. There's a J&J Janssen one. There's the Moderna one that I took. And then, and then there's Chinese ones and Russian ones and Israeli ones. Now, I just heard... Um, Warner say, he used the term RNA vaccine. Are all the vaccines RNA vaccines or do they differ in some way? No, the vaccines come in general in four flavors. Um, we have first the, R the RNA vaccine. Uh, the, the, this is a nucleic acid based vaccine. That's what Warner just explained. You basically mm -hmm. give the virus, uh, give the body a genetic blueprint of a piece of SARS-CoV-2 of the virus that uh, causes COVID, um, and uh, and the body makes the protein and then trains the immune system to recognize the whole virus when it comes in. Um, that is the Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Mm -hmm. But we also have. Um, viral vector vaccines, which are the AstraZeneca, the J&J, &J, and also the Russian Sputnik vaccine. There we piggyback basically the, the genetic blueprint of the, 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 the piece of SARS-CoV-2 onto another harmless vector that then gets shuttled into the into the body and then produces basically the piece of the of the of the virus that induces immunity. And then sort of more um, conventional methods are so-called protein subunit vaccines. That's the Novavax vaccine. It's, it's lately in the news. There, we basically produce the piece of the virus outside in the laboratory, then inject it and, um, and let the immune system recognize it. And last but not least, the fourth approach is when we just use the whole virus, inactivate it, um, and inject it. This is probably the most, the oldest way to do this. Um, and it is currently applied by several Chinese camp companies. Thank you for that. Now, I've heard some people say that the, um, the RNA vaccine, I suppose, design or concept is new. Is that true? It is relatively new. It's relatively new compared to uh, the other um, 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 approaches that I just explained. Um, it is, but it is not, um, you know, it came very fast down the pipeline in the last year, amazingly fast, as Warner has uh, pointed out. But it is not, this is not when we, when it was invented. There is a whole research um, that has gone into RNA vaccines before, but it has not been tested um, in an infectious disease setting to induce immunity. So there was a certain amount of uncertainty how active they would be um, and, um, and how, um, how easeless or, or how difficult it would be to apply. And I think the, the key now is that what we have learned is that they have exceeded our expectations that they have performed at a much higher level with a much higher level of protection than we had anticipated. Um, the, the big disadvantage is that they have to be cooled. Um, they have to be kept at a, at, a, at, a, at a very low temperature in order to be active. And I think that that uh, makes the rollout of the vaccine more difficult. Right. But, in, but in terms of efficiency, they have exceeded expectations. Thank you. So um, Warner, I'd like to clarify uh, a statement with you, if I may. Uh, so the CDC says, quote, based on evidence from clinical trials, 
the Moderna vaccine was 94.1% effective at preventing laboratory confirmed COVID-19 illness in people who received two doses who had no evidence of being previously infected. What does that mean? Oh, the, <clears throat> the endpoint used in the clinical trials for both the Pfizer and the Moderna trials were um, SARS-CoV-2 induced disease. You had to develop symptoms. Now that could be something as minor as a runny nose, a sore throat, mm -hmm. or as serious as pneumonia. Uh, that would require hospitalization. So the full range, any type of symptom, uh, you could lose your sense of smell or taste. And then they would confirm that you were infected with the virus using a PCR test. So any, any form of disease. And these, these two vaccines were 94 to 95% uh, protective. So thank you. So, th so that, that statement from the CDC talks about um, preventing laboratory confirmed illness. Um, what about, uh, people have asked me the question, okay, so I've, I take these two jabs, um, and can I infect others? So let's say, let's say I am a, let's say I've had my two vaccines and then I contract it and I'm, but I'm asymmet I'm a, asymptomatic. Uh, can I pass that to you? That's a great question, and we don't fully know the answer. There are three studies that have been done, and each of the three studies are suggesting that there's a 60% reduction, roughly around a 60% reduction in terms of the frequency of asymptomatic infection, but that's actually measured before you reach your full immunity. Um, so we can expect that 60% number to go up. Will it reach 100%? We don't know yet. Uh, but there is, I mean, it really depends upon that kind of sterilizing immunity that would wipe the virus out in the nose, even in an asymptomatic individual, depends upon really making good antibodies and creating a sterilizing uh, environment within the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. So we don't know yet. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, but uh, we don't know. Okay. So, Melanie, I wonder if I could drill down a little bit on a, a point we've discussed, which is... Um, so um, these vaccines have been tested uh, fairly rapidly, uh, that is to say over a relatively short period of time in, in clinical tri trials. Is that, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And, yes, and the, and the cohorts are tens of thousands of people, 40,000? I'm, I'm approaching 100,000 if you add it all up, I think. Approaching 100,000. Yeah. So, um, you know, some people have said to me, Okay, I'm a little concerned because tens of thousands, hundred thousand, relatively short period of time, um, but there's uh, seven billion people on the planet. So, um, has it been tested on enough people? Yeah, I think I think these these clinical trials have been done um, accelerated in an accelerated fashion. I mean, we have all heard the number that it takes ten years to good to, to to build a good uh, vaccine and to make sure that that it is fully safe. Um, of course, we would like to see it in a larger population tested with more diverse. Um, um, genetic background. However, I think the, um, the the studies were designed to go into you know the different populations, and there are study arms in in South Ar in South Africa and South America in South America. So I think there there is a huge effort in in recruiting um, you know a variety of of of, of uh, genetic backgrounds to these. Now we also in more than 130 million uh, people worldwide that have received the first dose, um, at least the first dose of the vaccines. So I think we will rapidly um, learn more about um, what is uh, what is going on. Um, but I think um, the um, the need to be uh, to be accelerated and to have these vaccine available fast has shortened the time for the clinical trials. However. Um, the, 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 the data that are coming in now will be equally used to learn um, about these vaccines to make them more safe. I might just add to Melanie's comments, which I totally agree with. The uh, emergency use authorization was extended with two months safety data. And with most vaccines, most of the safety signals or problems will emerge within that two month period of time. 
Uh, however, for these vaccines to be fully registered, fully approved by the FDA, a much longer safety period, up to six months, is going to be uh, be required. And so they're continuing the, the trial and collecting safety data. Now, interestingly, there was no, we did not pick up the anaphylactic uh, reaction, the, the allergic reaction in the uh, in the trials. That really emerged only when, when mass vaccinations first started. I remember day one mm -hmm. in England, there were two nurses or two medical personnel that had anaphylactic uh, reactions. And we now recognize that as occurring, you know, like one in a million, between one in a hundred thousand and one in a million uh, people who are vaccinated can have an immediate type hypersensitivity reaction, easily treatable. But that's why we all, that's why all vaccinees are held for 15 uh, to 30 minutes after the vaccination, just guarding against that possibility. After we had our uh, first jab on, on Saturday, we, we did wait for 15 minutes and I had no, my wife and I had no uh, ill effects. And in fact, I, I felt like I was ready to throw a baseball, but of course that's <laughs> not indicative of anything other than, than me. Um, so in a way I want to kind of try and encapsulate what we've talked about so far uh, in a very simple way. It sounds to me like what you are saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that the COVID-19 vaccine should not be seen as a magic bullet. That is to say, throw away the masks, don't, you know, start hugging strangers, go to big parties, that, that because we don't have enough information, caution, would, would that be the watchword? I think the recommendations are clear. Even if you're vaccinated, you need to practice um, social distancing, okay. masking, and um, regular testing um, because uh, we because you can still be infecting others because of the, the threat of uh, asymptomatic reinfection. And I think we're going to probably get into this, but we also lots of uncertainty currently about the variants and how effective the vaccine will be against them. So I oh, think there is no get into that. Yes. There is no there is no guarantee currently. There's absolutely uh, what you have said. I think they are they are fantastic, but they are not the magic bullet currently to um to give up on all the um social practices. Okay. So it's it's a it's a it's a step or it's an added protection um but it's you know, but it's not invincibility. Now I I would say that if the vaccine also proves 95% effective against asymptomatic transmission, then it is the full magic bullet that will get us away from having to mask, as will creating a state of herd immunity within, within the entire population. If we get enough people vaccinated, we're, we're not gonna have to wear masks for the rest of our lives. These, this is an, an immune passport that can get us back to a state of normalcy. Well, you know, on that note, we, we just got, I think, a, a perfect question uh, from the audience. Uh, and it is, when will we, and this is for either of you or both of you, when will we learn whether the vaccines will need to be given annually? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a normal flu vaccine, right? Yeah, the, well, the Moderna CEO just recently said he thought that individuals that fall within the elderly uh, category may get annual vaccinations, uh, whereas younger people, the vaccine may hold for a long for a number of years. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to be true or not, uh, but it just depends upon how durable an immune response these vaccines actually create. So maybe I can add, I think the um, the natural, we're learning that the natural immune response is probably waning over time um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain time frame. And I think as we learn this, we can also extrapolate better into the vaccination. But I think we expect that the, um, that the vaccination, especially the RNA vaccines, might be better than the natural immunity that has been uh, created by natural infection. Um, and might actually um, um, really confer a much longer or, and stronger immunity. Um, so the, 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 the question is, we will have to monitor, to answer the question, we will have to monitor this um, and then learn um, as, um, you know, as the immune responses are now induced, uh, monitored, and then seen whether we see um, reinfections 
and how strong the immune responses stay stay alive. So for the sake of you know transparency in our discussion, that happens to be one of those things that we we don't yet know. Correct. That's that's a very that. big unknown. Yeah. Now, uh, since we're fortunate to have two professional virologists in front of us, I suddenly realized there could be people in the audience that don't know that a virus is not a living thing. <laughs> so could you could you simply <laughs> pretend this was virology 101 and very quickly and simply tell us what a virus actually is? No, do you want? Uh, I, I can start just there. It, it's it, it's really it's well. Viruses are fascinating creatures, but you're totally uh, totally uh, right. They are inherently incomplete, so they cannot uh, exist uh, on their own. So, in order to survive, they need to latch on to a a, a living cell. Us in this uh, in this case, and we refer to us as the host. Um, and, um, and, it, and and the whole sort of goal of a virus is to hijack, to multiply, and to spread. Um, it has to come into the cell. It has to hijack um, certain pathways in our or certain functions in our cells in order so, to support its own multiplication. And that is what it what it does. It multiplies, and then it spreads because uh, because either it gets detected in the initial host and gets eliminated by the immune system, or it kills the host, and then in that case, it would also be killed. So it's it's constantly on the run, finding new um, finding new hosts um, in order to to support its own multiplication. And I know Warner has, I'm sure, something to add to this. <laughs> it's a half dead, half alive professional pirate. Sounds like a vampire. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean that's fascinating, and that that would explain why why you know people talk about computer viruses because it hijacks the systems, right? In 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 your case, a biological system, and then the computer case, a, a mechanical system. Correct. This is this is a particularly interesting hijack, though, in that if you if you took a cell that's infected with the influenza virus and you sequenced all the RNAs that are being made within that cell, you might find about ten to fifteen percent of the RNAs are the influenza. Okay. Not so bad. Now, if you do the same thing with SARS-CoV-2, 80 to 90% of the, of the RNAs you can find in the cell are the viral RNAs. If this virus takes over. It just basically shoves everybody else aside and says, all right, I'm the new sheriff in town and takes over the cell. Wow. And the cells uh, don't survive this. Sorry? And the cells don't survive this. But the virus gets out. The virus is budded and released and spreads as the cell host that it's used dies. So um, thinking of vaccines, um, would it be true to say that whereas most medicines are designed to be given to sick people, vaccines are designed largely to be given to healthy people to prevent something from happening? Is that true? That's the general. That's the general idea. Yes, I think it's a prevention. It's a preemptive training of the immune system. So when the virus comes in, the immune system is prepared to tackle it before it can set shop and hijack, multiply, and and spread. I think some people have a hard time making sense of being given, you know, a foreign body, entity, chemical, something to prevent something that hasn't happened that they can't see or even think about. I think that's part of, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but that's part of the resistance some people have to vaccines in general. It feels risky because they haven't had the illness yet. Yeah, but you don't want the illness. That's for right. sure. I mean, vaccines have, have been a, a passport to health, be it me. Mumps, measles, uh, chicken pox, smallpox, yeah. polio. I mean, we uh, that, the history of vaccinology is a, a history of uh, uh, fantastic success. I want to come back, though, to something we were talking about, that using the virus, uh, using the vaccines to prevent an infection. These RNA vaccines were actually, are, are still, but first were being used as therapeutic vaccines. They're being used in the context of cancer 
Mm -hmm. that the person already has cancer and you're trying to train the immune system to attack that cancer. So that's that's a therapeutic vaccine in contrast to a prophylactic or preventive type of vaccine that we would use in infectious disease. So that's that's um, that's a way of thinking about it from the perspective of immunology. Correct. Correct. Okay. So um, so this notion of um, you know of giving giving um, a drug to a uh, to a healthy person. Um, some people have said to me, uh, it seems like the vaccines that are currently available, and we've mentioned some of them, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all model. That is to say, regardless of an individual's genetic variation, and Melanie, you referred to this earlier in our conversation, everybody basically gets the same thing, not personalized medicine. Can you say something about the thinking behind that, you know, it sounds almost like take one aspirin and go to bed. You know, it's like everybody gets the same shot, but everyone's body is not the same. Does that matter? I can say something to start with. I think we have to, in this case, go after the virus um, because the virus dictates what we have to apply because we want to immunize against the virus. However, we have we are privileged that we have actually a choice uh, of different virus uh, of viral entities or, or approaches, uh, vaccine approaches currently available. Um, so while we know that the RNA vaccines are incredibly effective and especially effective in the elderly, because one thing that we haven't talked about is, is that vaccination or the induction of an immune response is not necessarily the same and it wanes with age. So when we are older, we have a less strong um, response and that's actually very bad for coronaviruses because they are very dangerous, especially for the elderly. So I think... Um, I think what, what we have to keep in mind um, in to, to personalize this is that we actually have more than 60 vaccines coming down the pipeline. We have currently um, two approved by, by the FDA and a and, and, and handful um, approved somewhere else. Um, but I think in the future, we will have a chance to potentially um, use different um, vaccination approaches um, for different people. I think right now... Uh people tend to be given the, the vaccine that their provider is providing, you know, so that, I, you know, I, I got the Moderna one. I wasn't offered a, a menu to select from, and you, I think you had a different one. But so there may be more choice in the future. Look, I got an interesting uh, question here from the audience, which is related to this, uh, this kind of one size fits all. And, and the person says, um, uh, would we be getting a third shot of messenger RNA vaccine as a booster against variants? And, and of course, that we're going to move into the variant world just in a moment. But this notion of, of periodic boosters for the elderly in particular, do you think that's likely? Well, I think it's very likely that we may have to uh, boost or immunize people with a weaker uh, immune system more often. Uh, and so as you grow older, your immune system is not as vigorous as when, when you're young. But I want to come back to the to our discussion of vaccines that, you know, we have, we currently have 20 vaccines in phase three trials. Okay. We have two RNA vaccines, which have been approved, but the two RNA vaccines, it would be almost impossible to deliver these vaccines around the world. Yeah. We need vaccines with global reach and certainly the Johnson & Johnson single shot, no cold chain to uh, produce type of the vaccine that retains uh, activity against uh, uh, the variants. That is a very attractive vaccine for, for global, uh, global use. Um, we don't know how the, the, the Chinese vaccines from Sinovac and Sinopharm are going to perform, uh, but these are the, this is the old school full virus, inactivate the full virus, get an immune response against multiple proteins, uh, those could wind up uh, being very good and also uh, vaccines of global reach. That's what we need. We, you know, we can't be thinking about vaccinating in the United States. We've got to vaccinate the world. That is absolute key. Right. And would you say that because 
you know the the global population is is a is a is a ready uh, uh, a pool for these uh, these um, um, viruses. Yes, I mean we can't. You know, we can't just depend upon, you can't put up an antiviral border uh, around the United States. These viruses are, are global in reach. And so we need a solution that is equally global. I heard someone recently say uh, that um, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine has, demo- uh, sorry, virus has demonstrated that viruses are no respecters of national borders or political parties. No, well, they certainly are. Absolutely. They don't vote. Absolutely. And that's why we should not leave the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. I think, I think we're coming back. Isn't that true? I hope so. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'd like to move on to the probably one of the hottest topics in the last week or so in this, this notion of uh, a variance of the virus. Um, according to the CDC, there are now uh, several variants circulating globally and I'm just going to mention a, a, a few couple of examples, and then we'll open it up for discussion. The UK had identified a variant called B1117, which spread much more easily and quickly than other variants. It's now been detected in other parts of the world. And I think by the end of December 2020, it was found in the United States. South Africa, there's a variant called B1351 that I guess emerged independently of this UK one. And uh, it is also in the US as of the end of January, 2021. And Brazil has one called the P1. So, you know, uh, this was detected in the US at the end of January, which was what, um, two weeks ago? So let's talk about these variants because I know that even people that have received the vaccine are getting very, very spooked thinking that maybe the vaccine is not going to be able to keep up with the pace of mutation. I think that's definitely a valid concern. Um, uh, I, I, I want to just go back to our virology one-on-one from the beginning and, and, and extend it with two more sentences. One is that the variants are showing what viruses do. Viruses evolve, um, they make mistakes, and that's called mutations, um, and that helps them to adapt into certain um, situations. Um, so that's one. And the other one is that um, that these um, these different variants that we're currently seeing are very confusing because there's a lot of mutations um, mentioned, but I want to just draw the attention on two mutations or two numbers. The one number is 501 and the other number is 484. So the 501 is a mutation. All of them are in the spike protein, which is the antigen of the vaccine. And that is what's the problem because um, it might um, evade the immunity that the the spike protein is inducing. Um, But the 501 is basically first described in the the British variant. And it's also in the um, Brazilian and in the South African variant. This, This mutation makes the um, the spike protein latch onto its receptor in the cells better. So that, that enhances the spread and explains why these variants are so better uh, spreaders. The, the good news is that these this mutation is not evading neutralization by either reconvalescent sera from people who had been infected or vaccinee sera uh, from people who have been um, in, in, uh, vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the other number is the more worrisome number. It's the 484 number, which is also a mutation, and that you will see in various in various mutants. It's it's present in the in the South African and in the Brazilian um, uh, variant, and this mutation really um, uh, helps uh, the virus to evade the neutralizing um, activity of the antibodies that are induced either by the vaccine. Or by the um, or by the natural infection, and that's what has been watched. Um, it is not completely evading it um, or avoiding it. I think it is just lowering the effectiveness. Um, but I think this is where we where everybody has their eye on, um, and where Moderna and Pfizer have sort of started to potentially modify their their approach to include this mutation into a multivalent vaccine approach. And I know Warner has more probably to say about the effectiveness of, of the vaccines against these variants. 
Well, I think, um, thank you, Molly. That's a great summary of the, of the variants. The, uh, I think the UK variant, which probably by March will be the predominant strain in the United States, it's, uh, has, it's doubling uh, every 10 days here in the United States. So it will become the, the predominant strain. I think the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will hold up quite well against the, uh, the UK variant. Uh, the greater concern, as Melanie mentioned, South Africa and Brazilian uh, variants. And here, in fact, I, it's a little bit like a, I liken it to a boxer where you've got two, two fits. You've got the B cell and the antibodies and you've got the T cells. Well, in the case of, of, of the regular coronavirus, we've got both working, T cells and B cells. Now with the variants, Brazil, Brazilian and South Africa, it's like the boxer has one arm tied behind his back. Uh, he doesn't have the antibodies. The antibodies have been neutralized, or at least a big part of them, are really important ones. But it still has T, we still, the boxer still has T cells and can deliver a knockout punch uh, with T cell immunity. And in fact, most viruses are, the most important part of our immune system for control of viruses is our T cells. So um, stay tuned. We, we have not yet seen, we have not yet seen how the RNA virus, uh, the RNA vaccines will hold up against these variants. We're about to find out as the UK variant spreads and uh, the Brazilian and South African variants, we're going to see how they, the, how the, uh, in the real world situation, how Pfizer and Moderna vaccines hold up. I predict they'll hold up pretty well. So the, the big story in the news for those who are following this issue is what appears to be, I'm not sure if failure is the right word, but certainly uh, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine in South Africa, I believe, has been temporarily put on hold. Um, and this is not an RNA vaccine. Is that correct? Correct. That is, a, that is an adenoviral vaccine, similar to the J&J. Yeah. Can you can you say anything at all uh, at this stage about what has happened in South Africa to, you know, this experience of this vaccine? So I think the South Africans have asked, acted in a premature manner. The AstraZeneca vaccine is highly effective at preventing hospitalizations and severe disease. It shares that property with Johnson & Johnson and, and the uh, 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 and and the RNA vaccines. What the AstraZeneca vaccine did not do was to prevent mild to moderate infection. But that's not going to it's not going to kill anyone. It's not going to put you in the hospital. Um, South Africa pulled the plug on the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine because of that of, of that finding, uh, not not really taking into account that it can prevent severe disease, hospitalization, et cetera. So they have a million doses in South Africa that are going use, unused. They have 9 million doses in Sub-Saharan Africa that are going unused right now. So I think that I think they need to rethink that. Uh, of course, everyone there is waiting for the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine to, to replace the AstraZeneca. So, so if I understood, um, uh, what you said, Warner, a few moments ago, it sounds like the two RNA vaccines, that is to say, the Pfizer one and the Moderna one, at the moment seem robust enough to face this UK strain, which may become predominant by March. Is that? That was going to be. Yeah. yeah, I think the cur we don't have current numbers of them in, in South Africa to know how effective they are, but there are trials ongoing currently. But what we know is that they lower the effectiveness um, when, when you just use in vitro um, assays against it. So, we, but, but the prediction is that, it, that they lower it not so much that, we, that it will lose effectiveness. So I think the numbers are the, we still have to wait how the, the virus is, uh, how the vaccine is going to perform uh, in people in, in, in South Africa. Okay. I would say again that AstraZeneca has, has had another problem that has complicated their, their story. And that is that in their trial, they didn't recruit enough people who were over age 65. Okay. And even though the European Union has approved this vaccine, uh, many countries in the European Union, Germany, France, Norway, uh, and, and others are in, in Europe, 
are not accepting this vaccine for immunization of their older than 65 population. And Switzerland has said, time out, we're not accepting the, the AstraZeneca vaccine at all. So they've had some trial design issues. Um, and I think that there's a little bit of overreaction, negative reaction to AstraZeneca. It still is a good vaccine to prevent serious, uh, severe disease and, and hospitalization. And they were also a little disorganized in their in their initial trials because they had a they gave only they they gave only half of the dose by mistake, um, which was good because the, the the half dose was better than the full dose, but it was not planned, and so there was a little bit of a chaos surrounding this vaccine. Well, th th there might be a movie in that one. Uh, <laughs> Possible. <laughs> so we often hear this this concept, these words, herd immunity. Um, and I always think of, you know, like bunches of wildebeest running on the Serengeti. <laughs> well, people are talking about herd immunity and that that's important for the future of the pandemic in the world. Um, how do the vaccines affect herd immunity? And since it's unlikely that every single person in the United States will be vaccinated for various reasons, does that matter? So herd immunity is the... The, the, the mechanism by which if you, within a population, if you get enough people vaccinated, there there's some, some members of the herd that don't have to be vaccinated and they derive their protection from all the other members of the herd that are vaccinated. So that's the idea that we don't have to have 100% vaccination. Okay. Uh, we need about, uh, you know, most people are saying 75, I mean, the higher the vaccination number, the better. But that we could probably do quite well with this, uh, with herd immunity at the 75% level uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Maybe even a little lower than that, given the effectiveness of the vaccine. The, the bottom line is that vaccines are generating herd immunity. We need them to make, uh, to, to generate herd immunity, potentially better herd immunity than natural infection. Yeah, that's important. That's important because, you know, one idea that was popularized by some of the advisors of the former president and, and his administration was to just let this virus rip. Uh, and we're going to get herd immunity just by natural infection. Well, we you pay a huge death toll for that. Uh, and it's not clear that you, through natural infection, whether you establish a durable state of herd immunity. So you may be having a lot of people die and not achieving the goal of, 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 a, of a durable herd immune uh, population in the end. It was a bad idea. Wasn't that the um, policy in Sweden? Yes. I don't know if it, it still it, is. Did it work? It failed. It okay. failed. It failed. Have they switched gears? Yes, they had to. They, they were seeing so much death. And, and then they, you know, and then the second wave came and they got hit as hard, if not harder, than, than many other parts of, of Europe. So it was a failed, a completely failed experiment. It was also recently documented in Brazil, in Manaus, which had 75, estimated 75% herd immunity from natural infection and just was hit with a second wave harder than before. Okay. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to ask you the trillion-dollar question. Hmm. Uh, is vaccination the only way or the best way to combat the COVID-19 pandemic? And if so, why? You yes. start, Warner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And to answer your question, yes. We are, again, the benefactors of, you know, eight in very active COVID-19 vaccines. This is our way out. This is how we get out of this mess of this isolation of this broken economy of our kids back in school. The vaccine, by training our immune systems to recognize and defeat this virus, we can return not only to health, but to a society that can actually interact with each other. Uh, this is the secret. Yeah, but I would add that I think in, in, in parallel, we need to also make sure that other important aspects of fighting pandemics are 
uh, uh, strengthened uh, for for the next one in preparation and in dealing with this one and in preparation for the next one. And I would say testing is one that I think we need to keep an eye on. And, and that's something that we do very actively develop new tests at Gladstone. And also, I think antiviral therapeutics, I think we should not keep um, our eyes off them because especially with variants um, and potentially other pandemics coming uh, on the horizon, I think we should make sure that we focus on, on drugs that could potentially work against not only one virus, but multiple viruses or all coronaviruses in the future so that we are better prepared. And I think one thing where we can really um, have a good um, have a good angle here is, is catching these viruses at their Achilles heel, which is that they do need to uh, have our host support, study these host supports because many of them for many viruses are similar um, yeah. and then develop drugs against those so that viruses just simply cannot set shop uh, or cannot survive um, and, and multiply and spread. And so that that is something that we're very actively pursuing at Gladstone. Um, and I think the key is here, that um, that these host-directed therapies are uh, in some way beneficial because as we have seen with the variants, the virus can adapt very rapidly to anything that you put into its way, a, a vaccine or a treatment. However, if we target us as the host, we cannot do the same. So we have uh, much less uh, chances of resistance. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we've all bought products that uh, were in their first iteration, whether, whether it's software or it's a kitchen appliance. And, and sometimes the very first iteration uh, turns out to have had some problems. And, and by the time you get to version two or three or four, you know, it, it's ironed out. Um, so what would you say to people who, who say, look, my strategy is to wait my strategy is to watch these variants and wait until a better version of the vaccine comes along rather than being the first group that's experimented on. What would you say to someone? I've heard people say that to me. So what would you say to those people? I would say that I sure hope that you don't get infected. Okay. In the hospital because you have right now a 95% effective vaccine. Uh, we should take, we should embrace this and take full advantage of this gift that we have been given. Okay. Agree. I, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think the risk of getting infected currently um, is much higher than, than I, in my mind, than the risk um, of, of having serious side effects from these vaccines. As I said, they seem very new as if they have been, you know, coming down the pipeline in the last year. However, there has been a lot of research going into, um, you know, making vaccines, even the RNA vaccines in the in the cancer field have been tested before. Mm -hmm. So we know much more about them than we than we now can uh, can say about the SARS-CoV-2 about their safety. Um, and I think um, I, I was for me, it was a no brainer to take this vaccine. Okay. Um, so I'd like to shift gears now because we have, uh, oh, you know, 12 or 14 minutes left. I'd like to look a little bit to the future if we can. Now, I've heard it said that um, there are potentially three phases to the COVID-19 pandemic. The first phase was the discovery or the first reporting of the virus in Wuhan, China, under, you know, who knows where it came from, the WHO's been investigating this, but the, uh, from the discovery to the introduction of mass vaccination, so, so late 2019 to early 2021, that would be the first phase. And by that definition, we have left that phase. We're now in the second phase, which is mass vaccination to herd immunity. And people have suggested that that's early 2021 to late 2022. And then phase three is social adaptation to economic, mental health, political effects. So in other words, that this pandemic, quote unquote, ends sometime in 2024. Can you say anything about your view of the future? Because, you know, the average person who, you know, has a job or works in a restaurant or whatever they do, 
life is not what it used to be. And after a year of this, I think many people are getting extremely demoralized and they can't understand in practical terms how many more years this is likely to go on for. What can you say about that? I would say that uh, you, what you outlined is uh, more pessimistic than I would be. Okay. Uh, I think that it all depends upon how effective we are at scaling up the mass vaccination program. So right now we're about eight to nine, about 9%, I think, of the United States has been, have received a first shot. Uh, a little more than 2% have received both shots. Um, California is working hard, has given more shots than anyone, but uh, you know we are working hard to get up to, uh, up to full speed. I mean, things are changing. Mass vaccination centers staffed by uh, the military, uh, moving uh, drugs into the pharmacies. I mean, right now, though, we are facing a significant supply problem. And I think that uh, the president and his COVID task force uh, should take the lead from people like uh, the companies like Sanofi, who volunteered, whose vaccine didn't work so well, but now is volunteering their production facilities to make the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. Okay. I think pharma ought to come together and do precisely that. Let's get up our production so we don't have to talk about delaying second vaccines. Let's get enough vaccine produced that we can vaccinate the United States as quickly and effectively as possible. And that will be a great defense against the, the continuous spread of these variants. I totally agree. I think um, I think we are a little bit in a race uh, currently with the vaccine and the and the variants. And I think the the problem is that our numbers are just still insanely high. Um, I think we have let them spin out of control. Um, I think they're coming down, but still we have um, very high numbers here in the United States and other parts of the of the world. And this is what what makes variants arise. The more people are infected, the more chances of variants. That, uh, that can arise and, and spread. And I think we have to make sure that we get our numbers down. That's why we have to be vigilant and practice all our social distancing rules and everything. This is the number one, because if we get our numbers down, we also have much less chance of the variants or of new variants um, popping up and, 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 and causing surprises. And I think this is going to be this dynamic between numbers, vaccination rollout, um, and potentially variant emergence, I think, is going to determine how the next future is going to be. But I agree with Warner. I would also be slightly more optimistic. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, I had to play the devil's advocate on that one. <laughs> uh, so um, we've got a question from the audience, and it's really something we haven't even talked about at all, which is, uh, when do you think children will get vaccinated? Mm -hmm. uh Great question. Great question. So the Pfizer vaccine is approved down to age 16, the Moderna down to age 18. Okay. Uh, health companies are now doing uh, studies uh, down to, I think it was age 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I doubt that there will be uh, serious efforts to vaccinate children even younger than that for some time. Uh, that, that's my sense. Uh, because uh, young children really are, are generally have asymptomatic forms of infection. Now, the thing that could change that calculus, though, are the variants. Correct. There is some suggestion that uh, that these uh, these variants can attack children uh, at a higher rate. It may be because they can bind, you know, ten to hundred times tighter to the receptor. Uh, and children have fewer receptors, but if you're binding ten to hundred times tighter, that's enough. Uh, so we're going to have to monitor that very carefully in terms of uh, what the variants and uh, children. And just for completeness, I think we haven't really talked about the California variant, um, which is actually pretty prevalent here in California. So this is a new variant that we are very actively monitoring. And there's, you know, a large task force has been built to, to find out um, how, how dangerous that variant is. But it, it's taking slowly over in, in, in California. It is not having either the 501 or the um, the 484 number that I have told you before. Um, and so we have to deal with a set of new numbers here that we have to test and uh, and find out what, what it does to neutralization and, and spread. But it seems to be spreading very avidly and um, and um, and uh, 
and and pauses re- and will probably take over in, in the near future here in California. Wow. Um, so since we're sort of inhabiting the the future at the moment, uh, I wonder, looking ahead, you know, from the perspective of uh, virology, um, how do you think we can begin to prepare? for uh, new variants of COVID-19 that we can't even imagine, uh, as well as other viruses, because it seems like there is a possibility we are entering an age of pandemics. People are worried that, that the pandemic is the darker side of the, of the so-called globalization of the, glo- of the world economy, you know, that so many people are moving and spreading, and how would you ever control it? And thank God it's not anthrax we're talking about, right? <laughs> well, the animal-human interface is a very dynamic one. And more right. and more of the diseases that affect large numbers of people are what are called zoonoses. Sure. Multi-human transfer. Coronaviruses, three times in, 20, uh, in less than 20 years, these viruses have sprung into the human population and caused serious disease, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. Right. So we ought to be studying the bat. The, the reservoir of these uh, of, of these coronaviruses are in the in the bats. And we ought to be preparing ourselves in case one of those uh, new coronaviruses or the bat viruses begins to jump. Um, and it's not just coronaviruses. There are other uh, influenzas. There are all types of, of serious infections that we need to be preparing a, a greater heightened sense of pandemic preparedness. Um, I think we got caught with our, you know, we got caught without sufficient PPE, without sufficient, uh, uh, you know, all of the stuff that's needed to, to restore testing. Testing was an abysmal failure here in the United States. Yeah. And even now, even now, we're not sequencing enough of the viruses to, to really get a great handle on uh, how many variants there are in the country. There are probably more variants here in the United States than anywhere else because there's more virus here. Yep. Agreed. And and, and while we're dealing with SARS-CoV-2, there's another small Ebola outbreak in Africa. So the, the, the viruses are not resting while we're dealing with one virus. So one of the nice things about science is that, you know, it's, it's an international enterprise. And uh, I would imagine that you are in contact with uh, colleagues in other parts of the world. Would that be correct? Yes. Correct. Um, what can you tell us, uh, tell our audience about uh, what's going on now, kind of through international collaboration, if only at the science level, to prepare us for the future of, of malevolent, malevolent viruses? Rather, it seems like this time we were just sitting here as if there'd never been a pandemic in history and nobody was prepared. I, I maybe can say one thing before I let Warner answer. I think the the, the point, what, what was really amazing in this pandemic, I think from a scientific standpoint and, and, and from a collegial standpoint, I think the, the, the collaboration, the outreach, the interaction, the information exchange nationally and internationally was just unprecedented and, and extremely helpful. I think everything was accelerated. Nobody waited a week until they picked up their phone. Everybody needed the information now. Everything was shipped immediately. Um, it was just a, there was an amazing, um, you know, amazing interaction and um, and willingness of many scientists, not only virologists, to pitch in and to do everything that they could do. So I would say this spirit of, of, of collaboration and interaction, I think I wish that this persists because I think that will prepare us um, for the next pandemic and, and, and helps us to be hopefully better prepared. And I would just doubly emphasize what Melanie said, the, the collaboration, I mean, the, I've never seen anything like it in science. Uh, all the competition barriers broke down immediately, and there was so such good communication and cooperation. And if we could, I mean, we'd be unstoppable if we could keep that going. So we're we're nearly out of time, and um, you know, the thing about these uh, Commonwealth Club programs is that there's often a large audience watching them live. But then in a week to 10 days, it will be available 
uh, both in an audio and a video format. And then anyone can watch it in the world and you can send it to your friends. So it's a great opportunity for both of you now, Warner and Melanie, to uh, say to our audience, what do you think is, is the, really the most important thing you want to say about the COVID-19 vaccines? And can you reassure our audience that being vaccinated is the right thing to do? War Warner? Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, we have like I said, we've been given a gift. Uh, it's a triumph of science that we have at our, at our fingertips, vaccines that can deliver us out of this pandemic. Um, and they are safe, highly effective, more effective than anyone could have ever imagined. Um, and I think that uh, we should take uh, advantage of this rare gift that we've been given. I, I just say 100% effectiveness in, protect, in protecting against hospitalization and, um, and severe disease against all variants. I think that's the gift of this vaccine, um, or, or these vaccines coming down that we have and that are coming down the pipeline. And I think that should be, just by the pure numbers, um, should be um, very convincing. So, um, so uh, uh, in, in four weeks, I, I get my second uh, Moderna vaccine. That'll be early March. Uh, do you think that I'll have to uh, get a booster or do you think that'll carry me through the year? <laughs> or is it, is it impossible to say? I'm predicting that let, let's, be, let's be prepared. Now let's, let, you know, let's make the, the booster, the Moderna and, and Pfizer, let's make it. But let's hope we don't have to use it. And I'm, I'm more optimistic about the durability of the T-cell responses uh, that we talked about, that, the, that these, these RNA vaccines are going to hold up better against the variants than we thought. Okay. Uh, any other words, or would you say we've, uh, we've finished this uh, lovely discussion? Well, I'd just say wear a mask for now. Be sure wear a mask, socially distance, do all the mitigation stuff, and you know, get an appointment as quickly as you can for, for these incredible vaccines. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you. Uh, on behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to explain uh, to non-scientists and perhaps some scientists uh, all about the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. You know, this type of program is why I'm a member of the Commonwealth Club of California why I'm the chair of the Health and Medicine, because I believe that for 118 years, we have supported interdisciplinary, open discussion of important topics. So I want to thank uh, all of you, our audience behind the green button. Uh, if you're not yet a member, I'd like to encourage you to join. It's only $10 a month. Uh, you can also give a gift to the club to ensure that this culture of openness uh, continues. And now that we're digital, uh, we now have a national and a global platform. So again, thanks very much to Professor Dr. Melanie Ott and Professor Dr. Warner Green. I wish you well today and uh, thanks to our audience. Good night and be well.